women in leadership positions really should be partly judged on the amount of women they bring up into senior ranks with them. I'd had my heart broken a couple of times. I've been with one guy for eight years. They don't have to be biological children to give you a lot of joys. For International Women's Day, David Jones brought together some of Australia's most influential women to talk about what it really means to be a woman in today's society. I'm passionate about making a difference in women's lives. It's a unique opportunity for a group of uh, really impressive women. When you have a group of interesting, dynamic women coming together around a table, interesting things will always happen. All right, well, why don't we just start with each of us not defining ourselves, but just saying who we are. I'm Edwina McCann, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Vogue Australia and the chair of the Australian Fashion Chamber. Children married? I'm divorced, and I have two children, twin girls. Mm, divorced. Me too. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name's Lucy Turnbull and I'm an urbanist. I've um, recently become chair of the Greater Sydney Commission, which is a new organisation in start-up mode. And also, um, I've been in politics and I have a husband, Malcolm, who's currently in politics. <laughs> <laughs> we may have heard it differently. You, well, you made it. that sound <laughs> so <laughs> transient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a bit like Malcolm is my current husband. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but you know, he's in, he's in politics right now. Well, you've so got to marry someone, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you wish you'd married well? <laughs> you know, you'll do better next time. <laughs> Donna, tell us about you. So I'm Donna Player. I'm the um, Merchandise Director at David Jones. I am married with a 15-year-old smelly boy. They do smell. They smell a Does lot. And what about you? Haven't you got a hundred children? I have five <laughs> children and I left five years ago and I moved to Melbourne and I'm single and all my children are grown up. So yeah, last cap off the rank was uh, last year. Carla, what about you? Well, I'm a proud Torres Strait Islander woman. Where, where I'm at at the moment is uh, working hard to start my own business, my own consultancy. We all know what that's like. I think um, having worked for great organisations for a long time and been involved in that sort of startup space, that has taken a lot of my energy. But you look like into... a baby. Thank yeah. you. You look so young. We have a saying, black don't crack. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're allowed to say that. We're not. Oh, really? How old? 37. Wow. So, black don't crack. What age were you, Lisa, when you got married? Early 30s. Oh, grown up. So, yeah, I was, yeah, and I'd, um, I'd had my heart broken a couple of times. I'd been with one guy for eight years. So I'd sort of had all the different styles of relationship, lived with the guy. In fact, we were engaged. And so when I met Pete, I'd actually been single for 18 months. And I'm so grateful that I had that period of time. Which brings us to our young person. <laughs> Are you married yet? No, I'm not married. <laughs> Have you got a boyfriend? Yes, I do. He's very supportive, isn't he? Yes, yes, he is. How does he support you? In what way? He's making a website for me at the moment. So the, yeah, when I launch my robot in a couple of days, I have a new website to launch with, which is really lovely. And he cooks for me and he cleans for me. Wow. <laughs> and so much forethought. Do you put yourself in, dear, in this generation or in the ad-libbed, improvised uh, environment that we are? I think I'm a little, obviously, coming from the similar generation, a little more ad-libbed, but I don't really think I've ever defined myself or I, I really abhor definition and boxing. I think I've always been that way. So people may come to me and think, you know, you tick this box and this box and this box, but they, I don't think they're mostly what's important to me. Now, what about you, doctor? I have a PhD in biochemistry. Right. I work as a nutritional biochemist, for want of a better word, but I look at health from a biochemical perspective, so what's going on inside someone's body, a nutritional perspective, so what are the nutrients that are needed to drive all those pathways, and then the emotional side of the equation. So why do we do what we do when we know what we know? I care deeply about the juggling act that women now face, given that 
when we pause to think that science suggests that humans have been on the planet for about 150,000 years. So you look at the rate of change we've asked our bodies to go through. It's like never before in the entirety of human history what we're now asking ourselves to do. So I think that it's not that long ago that women were given the opportunity to do what were traditionally their father's jobs, but they've maintained what were traditionally their mother's responsibilities. So there's very little, if any, rest in that. And as a health professional, I witness the consequences of that in women's lives. Some of those who are not quite so young here might share stories about what the workplace was like before there were conscious efforts to open doors and pathways for women. Lucy, have you got experiences? Yeah, well, I think, I think values and expectations have changed Im immeasurably. I mean, you know, tectonically, you could almost say. I remember when I was a baby lawyer, it suddenly dawned on me there were very few female partners in this law firm and the one partner that there was actually didn't have any children. And I said, do you think that you'll be able to just, you know, leave work for six weeks and then belt back into the workforce doing the crazy 10 to 14, 16 hour days sometimes? And she said, oh yeah, that's what you have to do. That would be unthinkable today, mm -hmm. that you couldn't take, you know, maternity leave or parental leave because um, dads are now entitled to it too, which is great. You know, having a husband who's worked always extraordinarily long hours too, I thought that's, that ain't gonna work. That it's not going to be for me. So I kind of worked adaptively for a long time because I couldn't work in an organisation where there was no expectation or understanding that at some times you needed a more flexible life. Do you in any way see that as a sacrifice? Because your husband didn't have to do that. That was a choice you had to make. Do you just take that on board? What, what's your attitude towards that? Well, I think, I mean, in those days, the idea that husbands would take time off to look after children was, you know, that was, that would have been completely revolutionary. I mean, people like Jermaine Greer would have been saying that, but it wasn't part of the real world, how the real world worked. And I think nowadays it is becoming the way the real world works. So in that sense, our cultural expectations and, you know, the roles that we play have fundamentally shifted. Mm. And what about you, Donna? Would you say that fashion, when you started, mm. was largely a male business world? So in the, in the world of buying, it, it would be uh, chosen that most buyers are female. So in fact, that's where they are, but they don't tend to rise above the buyer role. So when I started out, there were lots of women buyers who would go off and have children and maybe they would stay off for a year or two years and they'd come back and go into another buying role. But the level above, the merchandise directors were men and the level above that, the CEOs were men. And you know, it's, I think it's still true. A lot of CEOs of many retail businesses in Australia are in fact still men. Now, Lisa, you've been in television mm -hmm. for on and off for many, many years. You are about to say eons, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Yes, well, I, I was. had a life in magazines before that, though. You did. Well, you were the youngest magazine editor the country had ever had, probably still. 21, editing mm. Dolly. Mm. So that was a male bastion still in those days, up the top level or not? Yeah, look, I, I absolutely recognise the, the struggle, particularly in law firms and these very male-dominated industries. But from the age of 21, I was basically encouraged to run my own business, mostly in employing other women. Even working for Kerry Packer, he, he pretty much said to me, he headhunted me from Fairfax to come over to ACP. He asked me what I was going to do with Cleo and I told him in no uncertain terms because I didn't actually want the job, so I had nothing to lose. I was just going to tell him what he could do with Cleo and then go back to Fairfax. But anyway, he liked the ideas and, and I said yes to the job. And then he basically said to me, well, that's it. We've worked out what I'm paying you. It's a shitload of money. <laughs> Now, I'm not, I'm not going to interfere at all. Just go off and do it. Don't tell me about it. Which was fantastic yeah. because I knew he had my back. So I really didn't, didn't ever have to defer, even though there was a male publisher there. And interestingly, I was, uh, I was employed by a female CEO, my first ever in, in the present job, and literally the same thing given the business. Yeah. It's not, you're not going to edit a magazine. You tell me what you're going to do with the business. You have to. Yeah. You have to and stay then, true and to your vision. And autonomy to you know, to run the business. Yeah, it's like, it's like yeah. being an entrepreneur and it actually yeah. makes you take responsibility for the business as well. People criticise the fact that women don't necessarily offer jobs to other women, that they have a responsibility. Madeleine Albright last week said her quote again, that there's a special place for, to burn in hell for women who don't support other women. 
What are our thoughts on that? Carla, have you got a view on that? Many of the, the women that fought, not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights, but also women's rights within that, I've been so blessed to have access to and be able to spend time with and learn from and get an, that absolute hand up from. Working in the youth space for such a long time, it's been ensuring that the next generation gets all of that, but personally, it's, it's been the girls. You've got to make sure that our women have those opportunities to continue to, to go um, into the spaces that they haven't been before, and particularly our, our Indigenous women. I mean, I still walk into rooms at, at my age and, and people think I'm there to get the coffee, A, because I look a little <laughs> bit young, mm. but also because they don't expect that the Indigenous woman in the room is there to chair the meeting. Yeah, right. So. I'm ensuring that our girls won't have to experience that as much or to the same degree or hopefully at all. I think that, that women in leadership positions really should be, you know, judged on their performance, but I think also partly judged on the amount of women they bring up into senior ranks with them. And uh, whenever I've been able to do that, I've made a point of doing it. Obviously, they have to be talented, but they have, when I've done that, they've turned out to be kind of super talented. So I think, well, you know, it was important to do that, but they were also absolutely brilliant at their job. But I think women in leadership positions have a particular responsibility there. Are children on your radar? Uh, not for a while. But you would, you would like to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but not now. I mean, I'm, I'm starting my companies and if you want to build a really big, large company, you have to devote a lot of energy uh, towards it. And I know that if you want really great children, you also have to devote a lot of time and energy towards them as well. I remember when I told my mum that I wanted kids, uh, I said to her, Mum, and you know, you can live next door so you can look after my kids. <laughs> and she said one day, you know, if you don't have time to look after them, then why do you want kids? And so I thought, oh, okay, I better, I better factor in some time to look after these kids that I'm going to have one day. One of the things I'm aware of, because you don't have kids. Stepchildren. Right. And step-grandchildren. Already. Yeah. Wow. Already, yeah. Wow. There's a lot of judgement of women who don't have children. Is that something that was difficult for you to deal with or you don't give a rats? I think what we know, what we were talking about before about time management. I mean, this is certainly something my husband and I talked about. My mother-in-law is very elderly. We've got to care for her. We've both got very demanding jobs that require different hours, late nights, weekends. We've got two children at university and they're going to have children soon. They're going to need grandparents. I think we really did the numbers and just thought, and how are we going to throw in a couple of other kids into that mix and be fair to all the, the draws on our time? And, I and it is quite a hard decision. I think a lot of people think they'll be able to juggle it, mm. but you can't juggle it all. You just can't. You know, something is, is going to not work out. So for us, there were still amazing joys we could have from our extended family, and, and that's continued to be that case. And there are lots of ways you can have children and and, you know, they don't have to be biological children to give you a lot of joy. There are judgments about that. I mean, you girls are both single as well at the moment, and, and I'm single too, and I find there are a lot of judgments about that, that you're a failure, you don't get invited to certain arenas, I don't know why that is. You're quite invalidated, and that's why I was wondering about if, if you don't have children too. There are certain things, milestones as a woman that you're meant to achieve. One, that you're meant to have a partner, and two, that you're meant to have children. So my eggs are on ice, before you ask. Yep, eggs are on ice. Really? You really did yeah, it. Really yeah, wow. eggs on ice. And what <laughs> age did you do that? Uh, last year. Big decision? No, no, not really. Um, I think, oh, I'm sure everybody finds this, but you get to a certain age and the world starts to feel like they own your ovaries. Yeah. And was getting a lot of questions, not just from family, but from random people. Oh, you know, the clock's ticking, this and that. And so I did some research into sort of how, at what age those th things that must start have, to happen. Do you feel a great relief that you dealt with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a nice feeling. Do the men of Australia know you're single? <laughs> yeah! Well, they will after this. Why are you <laughs> single? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. For me, I had my child 15 years ago, so it was more of an immaculate conception, really, so I didn't plan it, but um, certainly he was welcome as he is, still remains welcome to my life, in my life. But <laughs> well, this is being broadcast. Yes, this is being broadcast. Away. He knows you brought that we... Him home from the hospital. I did take him home from the hospital. But, you know, I have a, a husband who is 56 years old, but made the decision, he runs a small business, and made the decision that he would just open his retail business from 10 to 4, three days a week, and look after the child, which is, in fact, an incredible privilege. So my husband's still the primary caregiver. He still um, gets that child ready for school. He cooks the meals. He does all the washing. So I'm in a, in a position of privilege, of course, that I can then devote 
my time to my career. Can I say that Malcolm was mm. the best sponsor and, and nurturer and confidence builder for my career yes. of any of the people I ever worked with? All I sit here and think that is, God, I just should have planned my life better. <laughs> oh no, mine was your chance. It was a dance party in the 80s. <laughs> My feet hurt and my, you know, he got me a chair. But um, I made a good choice at the time. Could have been any one of those boys in that but room. But that sounds like that's a metaphor for the way your life has unfolded. Absolutely. And this I is the man who's been constantly pulling out a chair for you. Absolutely. And a great support and, and a great, I agree, a great um, encourager of, of the work that I do. So you deal with people who are on the threshold of you know, stress, burnout. And what, mm. what do women do? What can they do? if there's no one that believes in them and they don't believe in themselves? It's incredibly hard, especially if they are the caregivers, especially on their own for other humans. And when, when they feel like they're not okay the way they are, that's what has to be sorted out before their health will come back into line and before their life will start to turn around. So there is so, that's why I'm so passionate about people understanding the way they perceive themselves because it truly does start there. And while ever, I'm really sick of the question, can women have it all? I'm not interested in that conversation. You only feel like you don't have enough if you don't believe you are enough. I think whenever the pursuit is the, the having for self, it, it doesn't work. And you're never satisfied, no matter how big, no matter how grand or how basic it is.